Good afternoon, everyone. We can go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability webinar series. Before we begin, we wanted to quickly review some housekeeping items. This session will be recorded and will be available after the event. If you have questions, please place them in the Q&A. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer many, if not all of the questions. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Today's speaker is Dr. Kevin Taylor, who is a medical director, a certified executive coach, and change practitioner. Today, Dr. Taylor will be presenting on systems approach to creating purpose and meaning for your physicians and your healthcare organization. Hello, Dr. Taylor. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hand our virtual microphone off to you. Thank you, Brittany. This is great to be able to join all of you. So the learning objectives for today, we're gonna to talk about healthcare systems and how we can create conditions where professional well-being can be possible. To identify specific leadership behaviors for our physicians and how they can improve our team satisfaction at work. We're gonna add a specific tool to the toolbox for our physician leaders called active inquiry, which is effective to engage and empower our physician colleagues. And those two words, engage and empower, are gonna come up throughout the discussion. And then I'd like to share about our daily team huddles, which has been an effective method of engaging and empowering both our physicians and our teams, especially during this COVID pandemic. So I'm excited to be with you all and to share with you and talk about systems, healthcare systems. Why uh, do we need to focus on our healthcare systems and what impact can we have through our healthcare organizations in driving meaning in work? This is a diagram that I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, let me give you a little historical background. In 2007, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement came up with the triple aim. The goal was to develop a framework to improve population health. That triple aim focused on three specific drivers, uh, improving the healthcare outcomes for our patients, improving the patient's experience of care, and decreasing overall costs of care. It was the belief that if we redesigned how our healthcare organizations did their stuff, how health systems were organized and operated, uh, to be able to achieve these three uh, goals and objectives, that we would improve population health. Well, let me share with you a story. I had the opportunity within the last few months with my role as medical director to talk to a young colleague who's been in practice for only a few years. Uh, this physician said, I try to be very efficient on my day-to-day -day work, so much so that I uh, begin pre-charting the night before, looking at all my patients who are coming in for chronic care visits, they have longer problem lists and many more issues that need to be addressed. And I try to get caught up even the night before. When the day starts, I already feel behind with all the work that my medical assistant needs to do with pre-visit planning. And then I'm trying to provide access so patients don't go to the ER. We're trying to do the annual wellness visits in the midst of the chronic care visits. By the end of the day, I'm exhausted. I go home, I try to regenerate a little bit, kind of recharge my batteries, spend a little time with my family, and then later in the evening, I'm back on the computer doing pre-charting for the next day. This is an example of, I think, what many of us are experiencing across the US healthcare system as we are seeking diligently to achieve triple aim goals. Well, in 2014, Dr. Tom Bodenheimer and Dr. Chris Sinsky said, you know, we believe that this aim for triple aim goals is actually probably causing a deleterious effect on our colleagues, just as I shared with you. And they proposed a fourth element to this framework, which they called clinician well-being, the fourth aim. 
They believe that this quadruple aim needs to be the focus of our health systems. And in fact, our healthcare organizations should focus on trying to care for the clinician and the care team first so that they could be more effective in being able to care for their patients, believing that this is likely going to be resulting in better patient outcomes, improved patient experience, and potentially even decreased cost of care. So with that in mind, Dr. Tate Shanafelt and Dr. John Nosworthy and Mayo Clinic published this article in 2017, identifying the specific strategies, nine organizational strategies that they felt health systems should pursue and executive leaders should implement in order to promote engagement and reduce burnout among their physicians. Specifically, they noted that burnout is a system issue. It's not solely the responsibility of the individual physician. This concept that physicians are actually not the primary reason for burnout was corroborated in this study published in the summer of 2020 by Colin West and colleagues. What they did was a cross-sectional survey of physicians across the country and compared them based on resilience measures to the general US working population. What they found was that in fact, physicians had a significantly higher resilience score than the general employed US population. Knowing that, however, even the physicians with the highest resilience scores still had burnout, 29% actually of physicians with the highest resilience scores in this survey experienced burnout, suggesting that this is not an individual issue with weakness. In fact, our physicians are more resilient than the US population in general, but this is a system issue that needs to be attended by our leadership. So let's go back to that Shanna felt Nosworthy article where they identified the key dimensions or drivers that are going to be able to lead to engagement to that vigor, dedication, and absorption that they want to see among their workforce. They identified several elements and they realized that if you don't move in this direction, the consequence is going to be burnout. What I think you were hearing from this story that I was sharing from this physician earlier, a feeling of exhaustion, of cynicism and inefficacy. And they concluded their article noting the accountability needs to be at the leadership level within our health systems, where we need to have a sustained attention from the highest levels of the organization in order to make progress moving toward engagement. So you might ask, well, what's the evidence that leadership actually has an impact on burnout and satisfaction? Well, this would be the article you would reference. Dr. Shanafelt and his colleagues studied over 2,800 physicians and scientists in the Mayo Clinic system. They used a validated tool for burnout and the Mayo Leadership Index, a 12-item leadership index. What did they find? They found that the single biggest driver of professional satisfaction was the behavior of each individual's immediate manager. It's that leader at the department and practice level that has the most impact on your sense of well being, your sense of satisfaction in your job. They noted that a critical component of that physician leadership is the ability to engage and empower their colleagues to be able to solve the problems that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in their work units. How impactful is this physician leadership on burnout and satisfaction? At the work level, 11% of the variation in burnout and 47% of the variation in satisfaction was explained by the leadership ratings of that immediate manager. So you can see as the picture is starting to come forward, 
how important leadership is in driving satisfaction and decreasing burnout. So what are some practical steps that we as physician leaders could implement? Well, Dr. Steve Swenson, one of the co-authors of that leadership article in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings shows that listen, sort, and empower are some very simple steps that we can do as physician leaders. And he talks about it as a participatory leadership framework, very different from the uh, top-down autocratic model where you have one or two individuals that identify the problems and come up with the solutions. This participatory leadership style you're going to see as a theme going through this discussion. This is the three steps to listen to the team, assessing what works well and where there are local opportunities for improvement, to sort through the list of uh, opportunities, identifying the ones that would have most impact and be most feasible, and then to empower them to implement solutions to those ideas and, and issues. This has also been discussed in the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's white paper on the framework for improving joy and work. This has also been co-authored by Dr. Steve Swenson. They talked about participatory leadership and they framed it in a concept that we're all familiar with as clinicians. When we go to see patients, what do we do? One of the first things we do is an open-ended question. You know, what's on your mind or what matters to you? And they said, that's a helpful framework for a participatory leader as well, for a physician leader wanting to engage their team. So we see on this slide, the four steps to participatory leadership, active inquiry, which involves powerful questions and active listening, engaging your team to identify the pebbles in your shoes, knowing that there are a lot of things that we experience in our day-to-day -day work that we can actually take charge and improve on, empowering our team to solve those problems and utilizing scientific improvement methods such as the model for improvement or lean process improvement methods to ensure what I call the three S's, the success of your implementation, the sustainability over time, and the ability to spread this to other sites. This participatory leadership framework begins with active inquiry, which is a great tool for your toolbox. And here's how it sounds. I had an opportunity to talk with a colleague within the past few weeks. This individual has been in practice for over 20 years. And they wanted to sit down and just talk about their experience. And so at the end of the day, we went into a conference room and we're socially distancing with our masks on. And uh, I opened the conversation by asking, what's on your mind? And the individual responded, it's harder to deliver good patient care and stay healthy mentally and physically. I paused for a moment and I said, tell me more. And she began to talk about her own experience within her own pod, within the practice more broadly and within the larger health system. Issues and concerns, those pebbles in her shoes and some of them were boulders in the road that were a little bit outside of our control. And I listened and periodically would ask, and what else, and what else? In over 45 minutes, we were able to get a litany of issues out on the table. And then I said, what's the most challenging issues for you here now? And she began to prioritize the things that she really wanted to address. And we were able to come up with some specific action plans. What I just outlined for you uh, is some powerful questioning that is referenced in this book, The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay Stanier. It's a well-referenced coaching habit for professional coaches. And in this book, Stanier indicates that as a manager or for us as physician leaders, 
there are three questions that we can ask that can really initiate a constructive conversation with our employees, with our physician colleagues and our team. Three questions to basically effectively engage our team. The first, what's on your mind? And then the awe question, an acronym for, and what else? What's the real challenge here for you? This is a great summary question that helps to bring focus and to helps to prioritize leading to a few specific action plans for you working with your colleagues. Common theme in all of these questions is the word what. What and how are excellent words to start open-ended questions or basically start powerful questions as you're engaging your team with active inquiry. So I decided to go on my own leadership journey pathway with my physician colleagues and chose these three powerful questions, which actually come from the IHI white paper, as well as the listen, sort, empower module. The first is what is most meaningful to you at work? What works well in your workday? And how could we make more days work well and be filled with meaning? You can see that all of these words are starting with what and how. It's a real powerful open-ended words. They're very uh, forward focused, looking at things that we could do moving forward. And they're framed in a very positive way. So what did I find? Asking them what is most meaningful to you at work, two themes came up. The first are patients. And these were some of the comments. The patients, the impact I have had on their lives and getting to know them over the years. What I do for my patients behind closed doors, that is what is meaningful to me. Helping people, seeing patients getting healthier, making a difference for our patients, impacting their health and wellness. Over the past few months, our team has been finding various quotes from Robin Williams movies as a source of inspiration. Uh, and this quote from a Patch Adams movie, I think really captures the depth of meaning for us as physicians. In this movie, Patch Adams states, you treat a disease, you win, you lose, you treat a person, I guarantee you, you will win no matter what the outcome. So what else is most meaningful to you at work? Another theme came forward, the team. Some comments, happy relationships with the team, team building activities, coworkers, I love the whole team, the collegiality and camaraderie between my physician colleagues. I think we all know how impactful and how meaningful it is for us to belong to something bigger than ourselves, to belong to a team, to be able to contribute to a team. This is reflected in a quote from a Dead Poet Society uh, movie uh, where uh, the character Robin Williams states, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? What I found in talking to my physicians and asking them what's most meaningful for you was relationships, relationships with their patients, relationships with their teams, and to be able to make a contribution that's bigger than themselves. That internal motivation, that intrinsic drive within them keeps them going 
day to day to day. And this is outlined in the book that's well known, Daniel Pink's book on drive, what really motivates us. He states that the pursuit of meaningfulness is a fundamental intrinsic impetus. We are all driven to find meaning in our lives. He states to have a larger goal in mind is more motivating and activating than money could ever be. Instead of striving for the highest possible profit, people who pursue meaning in their lives want to give something back to society, which in turn also gives them personal strength. What Daniel Pink outlines in his book are three intrinsic motivators, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. What I wanna share is that they are really the constructs of participatory leadership. Autonomy, the team is self-directed, empowered to identify the pebbles in their shoes. Mastery, learning new skills to solve the problems. And purpose, working together to provide more effective and efficient care for their patients. Interesting, this concept of intrinsic motivation and its impact on burnout was highlighted in this article, Physician Burnout Interrupted, by Dr. Pamela Hartsben and by Dr. Jerome Grootman. What they noted is that health systems creating positive and negative extrinsic motivators like financial incentives or financial disincentives actually erodes intrinsic motivation, eventually leading to burnout. Think of that story of the physician I shared at the beginning of this talk. They argue that the problem of burnout will not be solved without addressing the internal motivations, which they describe as autonomy, competence, and relatedness, essentially the same things that Pink outlines with autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so you might ask, that's great, is there any way that we as physician leaders and our health systems could promote these internal motivations? Well, I think there might be. In this article published in 2019, Dr. Derby and her colleagues look at professional coaching and its impact on well being and distress of physicians. They had 88 physicians that they broke into two groups, a randomized trial with uh, a control group of 44 physicians and 44 physicians who received professional coaching. And what did they find? That the participants in the professional coaching group received 3.5 hours of coaching over a five month period of time and had a significant reduction in emotional exhaustion and overall symptoms of burnout, as well as improvements in overall quality of life and resilience. So what does professional coaching entail? Well, it begins with an open-ended question, like what's on your mind? And it takes the physician where they're at and follows where they wanna go. So what were the topics that these physicians wanted to discuss? They were all driven by intrinsic motivations, optimizing meaning in work, integrating personal and professional life, building social support and community at work, building leadership skills, pursuing hobbies and recreation, engaging in self-care, strengthening relationships outside of work, and improving the work efficiency of the team. 
They noted, however, that there were some elements such as depersonalization and overall satisfaction in their work that did not improve with coaching. And it underscores the importance of addressing health system issues and that the organizational efforts need to continue to improve the practice environment to address these underlying drivers of burnout and dissatisfaction among physicians. So let's return to my participatory leadership journey with my colleagues. And I asked them this third question, how could we make more days work well and be filled with meaning? And then followed with, and what else? And listening to them. And a lot came out, 72 items overall. So our leadership team got together and did the sorting part of the listen, sort, empower, and put them into these four buckets. Our electronic medical record, as one of our colleagues stated, all the time I take to order labs and referrals, it's taking me away from my patient care schedules. I can't continue at this pace. Inbox. I'm doing one to two hours of pajama time on my computer. Workflows. I just want everyone to do their job. We did a back of the envelope impact feasibility, which again, you can find on the listen, sort, empower module. And we came up with a list of action steps over the next few months. You can see here, uh, developing a protocol for our nurses to be able to manage some simple things like urinary tract infections, uh, revising our standing order set for our medical assistants and so forth. But I wanna talk specifically about daily huddles. I think we all know uh, the impact that daily huddles can have. Uh, and the typical picture is a bunch of folks gathering around a visual management board. Um, huddles are effective for being able to maintain smooth operations in your practice, uh, anticipating any special situations or unique needs for that day and supporting the needs of the patient and the team in real time on a day-by-day -day basis. So we don't have the ability to gather around a huddle board right now during this COVID pandemic. So we've used the medium of Zoom to huddle. Uh, we block some time at 1245 to one o'clock so that all of our team can get together. Uh, and this is our agenda. It's a standard agenda that we do every time. We review the schedule. We look at any specific access issues. We follow up on previous issues. We ask, are there any pebbles in your shoes? We provide opportunity for announcements and then shout out, recognizing members on the team. So we have a huddle board where we allow our staff to write down the things that are the pebbles in their shoes. And on the huddle board, it states, it isn't the mountain that you need to climb that will wear you out, but the pebbles in your shoes. A quote from Muhammad Ali. We really believe that engaging your team to identify those pebbles in your shoes, the things that they have control over that they can solve is a great first step in the participatory leadership journey with your team. So here are some of the pebbles in your shoes that our staff shared. A triage nurse stating, when transferring calls to the nurse, this is to the reception team, please put the patient name and date of birth in the task box. Medical assistant on prescription refill protocols can the docs go over the protocol and update so that we know what we can and can't send so that we can all be on the same page? And one of the medical assistants, when is the next shipment of hand soap and bleach, non-bleach wipes arriving? I didn't see any in the supply room. From the reception team, we need to manage the high volumes in our waiting room on Tuesday mornings. 
this is an example of how we're able to engage and empower our teams in a specific team huddle that we had recently. And these were the messages on the Microsoft Teams huddle meeting board. A receptionist says, can we reevaluate the blocks and length of provider schedules to, to allow for at least some room for possible hospital follow-up visits? There was really an increasing demand of a lot of our patients, many of them uh, discharged from the hospital with COVID, and we wanted to get a follow-up visit within 72 hours. The clinical coordinator proposed, would it be possible to put one 40-minute block per day for hospital follow-up visits? One of the physicians then wrote out, I'm okay with that because if it doesn't fill, we could use the time anyway. And there were four thumbs up to that comment. Another physician stated, I'm fine with it too. And a third physician stated, if it doesn't fill, it would allow new patient access to the receptionist who brought up this pebble in her shoes stated, I'm only hearing good things with a smiley face. And the clinical coordinator wrapped it up with the action step. I will add these 40 minute slots to the daily schedule. What you see in this brief interchange all typed up on the Microsoft Teams huddle board uh, is engaging the team to identify a pebble in their shoes and empowering them to solve it in a matter of minutes. Our team huddles is a great time for shout outs. And here's some examples just from the past few weeks. A physician shouting out to one of our physician assistants stating, uh, shout out to this individual for seeing a patient for me yesterday, a challenging patient that needed an exam for acute pain. Thanks for the collaboration. A physician shout out to the medical assistant on his team. Thanks for managing the flow this morning with only two exam rooms and all our procedures, you rock. A care manager to the physicians, thank you for helping us to get our patients seen today. And a practice manager to the team, you're all doing a tremendous job with all the stress of COVID. I'm so proud of you. We asked the team to reflect on what comes to mind to them when they think about our team huddles. And this is all the stuff that came out, the team supporting each other. Uh, I love some of this connectedness in a time of separation, getting up-to-date information on a daily basis, collaborative, empowering. We're all in this together the team supporting each other. This was a message from one of our physicians recently. They said, I want to say that I've been getting amazing support from staff, especially my medical assistant team and my clerical team. The patients are still challenging, but it feels so good to have the kind of support I've been getting from them. We are in the zone. I think the team's chats with the daily huddles are paying off. Also, a shout out to our care managers at our meeting today. They have been managing some very complex patients with not so ideal discharges, and they could use a high five. They have been jumping in whenever needed to help. I am so grateful to them and to all of you. And I'd like to conclude with this quote from the movie Awakenings. The human spirit is more powerful than any drug, and that is what needs to be nourished with work, play, friendship, and family. These are the things that matter. And I hope I've been able to uh, share with you the importance for us as physician leaders to attend to the well being of our physician colleagues and our teams, because that's what really matters. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. That definitely is a wonderful quote. Um, I'm going to go into a couple of slides and then we'll transition into QA. 
for additional resources to support your physicians and care teams during this time, please visit the American Medical Association website. We thank you for your time today and hope that you're able to join our next webinar scheduled for December 9th at 12 p.m. Central Time, which will feature Dr. Kathleen Blake, who will present on practical practices, behavioral health integration. For general questions or comments, please email action.labs at ama-assn.org. After concluding this webinar, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief four question survey. We ask participants to please take two minutes to fill out the anonymous survey. Okay, thank you everyone. We're gonna go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Please give us a moment while we get our camera set up. Dr. Taylor, you should be able to start your camera now. Let us know if you need any assistance with that. There we there go. You are. Hey. Hello, we have several questions in the queue already, Dr. Taylor. So we're gonna just go ahead and jump in if that's all right with you. Yeah, sounds good. Great. Um, to all of our participants, um, if you would like to elaborate on a question or if you have a follow-up question, I'd like to encourage you to use the raise your hand function. Um, once you use that function, we can unmute you on the back end so that you can follow up. Uh, with that said, we can go ahead and jump in. Um, Dr. Taylor, let's see here. This participant is an internist who is also a health and wellness coach. Um, they would like to thank you for the discussion of the value of coaching as part of the way to manage burnout um, and would like to know when you, when you would think to see this being available widespread for physicians in residency and out in practice. Um, and they indicated that they believe it should be thought of as a necessity and as preventative. Yeah, and I think that's, as I'm reading it, I think they're referring to specifically to coaching, uh, professional coaching. And uh, as uh, Dr. Derby and Shanna Felt noted in their article, uh, you know, the, uh, the importance of building uh, resilience for our physicians, but also noting uh, that uh, to do that, uh, you need to have an effective organizational strategy that says that, you know, well-being is a priority. And, and coaching, uh, the Kaplan-Swenson article noted that only 38% of healthcare organizations are currently offering coaching to their physician leaders. So there's clearly a gap, there's an opportunity. Um, so uh, let me just share a little bit. So what I wanted to say in that, first of all, is that coaching is important um, and a certified executive coach engaging your physician leaders can really be impactful, but it has to be part of an overall comprehensive strategy that is uh, particularly looking at system issues. And, and that's part of the issue um, that sometimes our executives will uh, say, well, let's solve our burnout problem by hiring a bunch of executive coaches uh, and not getting to some really root cause issues around systems problems. Um, a little bit about what an executive coach could do, however, for particularly for your physician leaders to help them be more empowered. If you think around the particular um, work that many of us, and I, I think our colleague who's the CWO is probably addressed, uh, is challenged with this, how do you manage up in your organization? How do you influence your C-suite to really prioritize uh, well-being uh, as a strategic initiative? Uh, and that's where an executive coach could really be impactful, uh, helping that individual in terms of both being able to expand their network, uh, to have those influence conversations, those high stake conversations that are really gonna be helpful for them to even be involved potentially in strategic planning. Uh, what are those KPIs that are really gonna be uh, important that will uh, inform the organization uh, on the continuous improvement journey uh, to improve well-being and engagement? 
Uh, so an executive coach has a real opportunity uh, working with uh, like our chief wellness officers and other leaders uh, to really be able to be uh, coalition builders in the process of transforming an organization uh, into uh, being a, 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 a focus around well-being and uh, engagement for their physicians. On a related note, Dr. Taylor, do you think that the executive coach should be a physician? Not necessarily. Uh, and if you talk within healthcare organizations, it's usually about a 50-50 physicians. Some prefer a, another physician as an executive coach. Others would uh, prefer someone who's not an ex uh, a physician uh, getting a, a different uh, perspective. Uh, often the, uh, the fit, if you will, uh, is going to be individualized and it's based on uh, personality issues and, and others. If you look at some of the qualities uh, and characteristics of the leader uh, and how that matches with uh, that coach uh, are the key things that determine success. Okay, thank you, Dr. Taylor. In, in your responses, you know, you've you've referenced many wonderful resources uh, for our participants today. I do wanna mention that all of these resources will be available and sent to you after this event, along with a recording of Dr. Taylor's presentation. Um, with that said, I'd like to stay in, in, in line of the topic of coaching and ask um, this next participant's question, which is what is the role of professional coaching and physician leadership development? Yeah, and I think it is, um, I, I was kind of alluding to that already, uh, mm -hmm. say that you wanted to um, uh, work on being uh, effective in change, a process improvement or change management. And, and the Kaplan Swenson article, which uh, noted that 38% of health organizations are offering coaching now. They also found that the uh, three areas that are um, most in demand for leadership de development. Uh, the, the first is around uh, working with teams and team building skills. The second uh, is kind of a combination, uh, managing change and process improvement. And the third, it's kind of a general concept is communication. As we know, that's a huge area in itself. All three of those are areas that an executive coach could be impactful in. Um, and take, for instance, change management. Uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges for us as leaders is trying to respect the autonomy of our team as we're bringing them through a transformational journey. A transformational journey is like you have a, um, a burning platform that you have to jump off because this is no longer sustainable, this current system and we need to evolve into something different. Um, you know, so uh, the, it's gonna meet with lots of resistance and that's uh, an opportunity for our leaders to honor the resistance of their teams as they lead them through a transformational journey. And that's where a executive coach could really be helpful. There are some uh, very effective skills, um, uh, understanding the, uh, hand, heart, and uh, what I call the head, hand, and heart components of a transformational change process. I won't get into the details here. This could be another webinar, uh, but that would be a certain, certainly a, a, a great opportunity. The process improvement uh, tools, um, I alluded to that with uh, the fourth stage of, uh, this, of this leadership uh, skills of this um, participatory leadership is uh, utilizing scientific evidence-based uh, process improvement me methods like the model for improvement or lean process improvement methodologies. And, and those could be some things that uh, an executive coach could help uh, to de uh, develop within uh, their physician colleagues. Um, so those are just some examples I could go on in, in, in some of the other areas around communication or team building, which were identified also by the uh, New England Journal Catalyst article by Kaplan and Swenson, but you know, just some ideas about how professional coaching could be utilized. Mm -hmm. 
You, you mentioned the use of scientific improvement methods as the fourth step of the participatory leadership. How, um, how can participants be empowered to solve their own problems if they're not familiar with any of these improvement methods? Yeah, so the, the, what I would focus on for a lot of our teams is the model for improvement. One of the things I love about the model for improvement is that it's the democratization of, of process improvement, meaning that your team could learn this and implement it almost as uh, they go. Uh, so you could actually teach the model for improvement as you're actually implementing it. And that's how powerful this tool is. Specifically, a, a, um, a framework uh, that is the model for improvement in, in a certain form is the key driver diagram. And there are a lot of organizations that have been able to use this um, uh, listen, sort, empower, the empower part of that uh, is where you use a key driver diagram component. So you've already done the listen and the sort, and you now have a couple of specific initiatives that you want to improve on. Uh, you uh, develop a cross-functional team, as individuals who touch this process in various forms. Uh, so they have fundamental knowledge of it in its various forms. Uh, there might be some reception folks, some MAs, your uh, maybe some nurses and a few docs. Uh, this uh, cross-functional team of six to eight individuals comes together and brainstorms. Oh, first of all, they develop an aim statement, a SMART goal. What is the specific, uh, measurable, actionable, you know, relevant and time-bound uh, measure that we want to hold ourselves accountable for for this particular initiative? Maybe it's inbox management. Maybe it's being able to manage our phones in a timely manner, whatever it is. And then you, uh, this team just brainstorms change ideas and the key driver diagram becomes a uh, structure in which you will be able to um, implement those change ideas in a sequential manner uh, to be able to achieve your aim statement. So it's, it's a great tool and it's something that uh, I'm hopeful we could talk about in another webinar uh, coming down the road because I think it's something that you could implement tomorrow with your team, it's not that hard to pick up uh, and understand and you can learn it as you do it, uh, which is uh, incredibly powerful. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, that's really helpful. I'm, I'm gonna shift a little bit more to questions specific to your experience and your expertise. Um, this participant would like to know uh, when addressing resilience, if you see any variation among different generations, um, for example, are baby boomers managing differently than Gen Xers? Yeah, um, so the, uh, the answer is uh, yes. I think the, uh, the data, and I, I would not be able to quote specific numbers. I'm thinking of the uh, coaching data that was published where the physicians who were in the coaching group versus the control group, uh, there was, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, gender differences and the age differences do have an impact in terms of your uh, kind of ability to kind of take on coaching and implement it, uh, your ability uh, from an EQ standpoint, uh, what we call emotional quotient or emotional, in, I'm sorry, emotional intelligence, all of which are important elements to be effective as leaders. Uh, so I guess where I would uh, frame this uh, more importantly as an organization, when you are um, trying to develop uh, your effective, uh, de develop your physician leaders, uh, it begins by hiring them. And uh, the first thing is uh, making sure you're uh, in hiring individuals who have that emotional intelligence where they're able to listen effectively, uh, where they, they have the aptitude to engage uh, and uh, empower their team. Um, and so, uh, it, it's helpful to note that that is a learnable skill, uh, different from our IQ, which we think is a little more fixed. EQ is a learnable and develop, it can be developed, uh, but it's helpful to know out of the box, are we hiring somebody who's kind of got what we what we want? Uh, the next piece to that then is that you do invest in those people, uh, developing them. Uh, and uh, I already alluded to kind of the three 
areas that are most requested in developing our physician leaders uh, around team building skills, the process improvement, change management, and communication. Uh, and then it's helpful to be monitoring their effectiveness over time. And what Mayo Clinic developed with their Mayo Clinic Leadership Index uh, is a very effective validated tool that um, demonstrated when you are improving in your leadership skills, you actually will decrease burnout and improve satisfaction. So monitoring and measuring your leaders uh, over time, I think can be um, uh, a helpful part of that development, developmental process, giving them the necessary coaching, as I alluded to, and mentoring to continue to improve. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Taylor. You know, many of the interventions that you mentioned are available through our Steps Forward website, which you referenced during your presentation. And again, I just want to let you know that we will send you information on those Steps Forward modules so that you can do further investigation of the interventions that Dr. Taylor has mentioned here today. Um, this, this next question is also in line with your, your expertise and experience, Dr. Taylor. They would like to know what the ideal length of time recommended for team huddles sh should be. Yeah, so our team huddles are 15 minutes um, and we've evolved to do them uh, around the noon time hour, uh, 1245 to one. Uh, they do uh, sometimes stretch into the one o'clock hour because there's a lot of engagement back and forth. Uh, but generally we do about 15 minutes and uh, we clearly have enough to talk about in that time frame. It's often um, needed to just kind of stop it so that we can all get back to seeing patients. Great. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. So you you spoke a lot about buy-in and resistance. And I think this next question is really actually is really important. Uh, this participant indicated that they were able to get engagement from their department, but struggle because the larger health system is not committed to promoting physician engagement and reducing burnout. So what are some strategies to get their executive leadership on board with this important work? I think it's helpful, first of all, to realize that our executive leaders, uh, our healthcare executives, uh, have a, an incredibly difficult, challenge, challenging task, uh, both managing uh, profound external and internal pressures and challenges, especially now in this COVID pandemic. So knowing that uh, initially uh, what they have to deal with. Um, uh, but I, let me share a little bit about uh, organizational culture and, and frame it in that perspective. Uh, when you think about organizational culture, there's three levels to how culture manifests. Uh, the first is the outward uh, behaviors and actions of our uh, uh, constituents within an organization. Uh, the second level is the uh, values of the organization often espoused in their mission statements. And the third are those uh, sort of tacit uh, beliefs, um, the assumptions, the things that are not spoken, but everybody kind of knows it. You know, this is kind of how things go around here. And um, so when you, uh, as this individual says, when uh, we're trying to uh, move forward in developing a culture uh, that's really promoting the well being of our physicians and our teams, but we're meeting resistance. Uh, and perhaps our organization even says this is important for us. Our physician engagement is an important element of our strategic aims and goals. They have it maybe even in their mission statement or some values and so forth. Uh, but what you see when there's a discordance uh, between uh, your espoused values and what you actually see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is uh, when that this uh, discord occurs that uh, lack of continuity there's an opportunity there and that uh, because what you need to do to do is start to explore what are those uh, tacit assumptions and beliefs that underlie the real behaviors uh, what is it that really is driving what we do every day and that requires listening. And that's where the executives can begin 
by having listening sessions. And I think this is happening across the country now as more and more organizations are identifying that there's this gap between what they're espousing organizationally as a value and what's actually happening in the front lines. Uh, docs are burning out and so much and our teams are burning out uh, even though we as an organization say that we really want to address this issue. So you need to listen. You need to actually have uh, focus groups, town halls, some way of getting to the front lines as a C-suite team, as the CEO and other members of that team and spend some time with your frontline teams and understand what those issues are. That should hopefully lead to some commitments. Uh, and what I did want to share, and, and Brittany brought this up, the, um, uh, in uh, our AMA uh, 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 patient-centered uh, patient ex experience program. And on our website, we have the Joy in Medicine Recognition Program. And the Joy in Medicine Recognition Health System Program has uh, some specific competencies uh, that, uh, and that really provide a roadmap for how an executive uh, and our organization can develop programs that will create uh, well-being and, and engagement. And, and the first competency is around commitment, the commitment of the organization to this work. And, and I want to highlight that category specifically, because I think that's where uh, we could engage our executives. Um, the uh, first level of a commitment is uh, developing a coalition of individuals who are committed to this work. Often they become part of a well-being committee. Uh, and that coalition is crucial. The second level then is having uh, a financial commitment to leadership, often a chief wellness officer uh, or a chief experience officer who's dedicated to this kind of work as part of their job description. And the third level, uh, the highest gold level within our recognition program is that the organization has a strategic initiative, a strategic plan that has identified physician engagement and well-being as a priority, a key priority index. They measure it and they're monitoring it and they're putting eff efforts to improve it. Um, so uh, working along those lines, you can't get to the advanced stage without starting in the first stage. Um, and the last thing to bring up uh, and my work with ProSci, the change management organization, one of the things they teach there is that the uh, skills of the executive sponsor in any transformational change, in this case, improving our physician's well-being and satisfaction, requires three things, being active and visible, building a coalition, and communication. And they note specifically the uh, one thing, if you look at the cause for failure of transformational change, uh, is the lack of being active and visible as a leader. So going back to, again, the importance of these listening sessions, getting out there, trying to figure out what is the tacit assumptions and underlying beliefs that are causing this gap between our espoused values and uh, the actual uh, pr pr uh, behaviors and actions that are going on uh, in the field. So I hope that's helpful. There's a, a lot uh, in that question. Um, that we could talk more about, uh, but I, I do think that the uh, uh, the article uh, from Shanna Felt on uh, the nine strategies, organizational strategies that I alluded to in my talk, and and the Joint Medicine Recognition Program, the Steps Forward modules, are all great resources that you could uh, look at to help you in figuring out how to engage your executives in creating this new culture around well-being. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. As he, as Dr. Taylor mentioned, there are a lot of resources out there, a lot of resources that he's described today. So um, please note that we will be following up with a list of those resources and links to you after this event. We are at the top of the hour. So we're gonna go ahead and conclude the Q&A there. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, again, please feel free to reach out via the Action Labs email inbox. That's action.labs at ama-assn.org. Um, Dr. Taylor, I'd like to thank you so much for all of your time and expertise today. To all of our participants, thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again soon at one of our other upcoming webinars. 
Take care, everyone. Good. Thank you. Thank you.